kind words. Dr. Pem van Lommel is a Dutch cardiologist who has done a study of survivors of cardiac arrest. 18% of these survivors reported a period of consciousness during a time when consciousness was considered impossible, and 12% reported a full-blown near-death experience. Dr. van Lommel reported his findings in the Lancet Medical Journal in 2001 and published a book, Consciousness Beyond Life, The Science of the Near-Death Experience. Not since Dr. Raymond Moody reported his research in Life After Life in 1976 has the near-death experience been so subject to scientific investigation. Dr. Van Lommel spoke to a group of interested people in Northern California in May 2017. I had the opportunity to interview him. The interview was conducted in a room just off the lobby of Dr. Van Lommel's hotel. There was occasional audio interference where additional attention may be required. Dr. Van Lommel, in your study, you questioned 344 patients who survived cardiac arrest. What did you find in your study? Well, we started our study because out of scientific curiosity, because as a cardiologist, I was confronted with patients who survived cardiac arrest and told me about special conscious experiences that could not be possible according to our current mainstream materialistic science. So we started to do a study in uh, 44 survivors of cardiac arrest to know how we could explain the cause and content of what we call a near-death experience, which is a clear memory of the period of unconsciousness with the possibility of perception and cognition and emotion and uh, seeing re deceased relatives or go uh, through a tunnel or have a life review. And what we found in the study that 18%, 62 patients of this group, had clear memories from the period of unconsciousness. And then we compared the, the, all the medical and other uh, reports we had with the 282 patients who did not report any death experience. And what we found to our surprise that there was no difference at all. That means that we could exclude in our study that lack of oxygen in the brain or the use of medication or fear of death, a psychological explanation, or religion could explain these kind of experiences. And then we did another study, a longitudinal study with interviews two and eight years after the cardiac arrest with all patients who survived with an NDE and a matched control group of patients who did not report an NDE to see if the transformation you hear from patients, which is they lose the fear of death they have a new insight what is important in life, and they have enhanced intuitive sensitivity. This was the result of the NDE, of the result of the cardiac arrest. It had never been studied in a prospective design before. And what we found that only patients with an in-death experience have this classical transformation. So this is a kind of objective aspect of the subjective experience, which is a near-death experience. How have your colleagues in medicine reacted to your findings? Well, you cannot generalize it. There are colleagues who are interested in and colleagues who don't say anything and colleagues who are just have problems with it. But it was not important for me at all. Uh, I think what was important for me is how patients react when you ask them. And they are very grateful that they have at last the opportunity to share their, their NDEs with others. Because the problem with people with an NDE is that nobody is able to listen without any prejudices of commenting. Especially doctors. Mm -hmm. Usually the near-death experience is a positive experience and they are feeling happy, they feel unconditional love, uh, and they feel homesickness and they feel loneliness and they feel depressed because they cannot share their experience with others, which is a totally overwhelming experience which doesn't fit in our current Western world. So it, it's, uh, it's a, a spiritual trauma to have this kind of experience and it takes many, many years five to ten to twenty years to really accept the experience and to integrate it in your life which means that you start to change the life, change the way you live. And how do their lives change as a result of this experience? Well, they are more interested in spirituality, they are less interested in material aspects of, the, of life, a, a huge car, beautiful body, etc. It's less important. What is important is to try to love and have empathy and compassion 
first towards yourself, to accept your own negative aspects as well, which is not that easy at all. And then to love and have empathy towards others and towards nature. Because they feel interconnected, they feel uni unified with everybody else. They, and that's what also we call the enhanced intuitive sensitivity. They feel, feel connected with everybody, also with the endangered world. Mm -hmm. So they try to change the way they lived before. And that's also the reason that more than 70% are already in default. Because the part is that it's not the person he, uh, she was before. Mm -hmm. So what brings about this change, this basic change in people's personalities? The basic change is that what they have learned from this near death experience, which is also a learning experience, uh, that it's all about love towards yourself and towards others. And uh, so it's, it, it's, it's not doesn't fit in our competitive world. You don't have to be better than others, but you have to be, to be more love, uh, to give more love to others. Mm -hmm. And they learned in their life review that uh, because you're connected with the consciousness of others in the past, you feel how you uh, gave them problems or sorrow or, or anger because misbehavior of yourself. So you try, try to change the way you live. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed many near-death experiencers and what many of them tell me is that coming back from this uh, spiritual experience, this near-death experience, that they have a problem because they now feel that this world, the world they've come back to, is the dream and that the world that they were in was real. And they have a hard time adjusting to life living in a dream. Have you found that this is true with the, many of the people you've experienced? Oh yes, they, they really say, everybody tells me, it was more real than real, it was more real than here in this life. Uh, so that's true. And, uh, and also what's the problem for them, when they come back in their body, when they have to conscious return into the body, it's awful for them because they're back in their damaged body again with all the uh, problems they had by the disease, by the traffic accident, or whatever. a lot of pain again and, and limitations of them of the body again and they feel the consciousness is too big to be back in this small body so feel restricted in the body as well mm -hmm. well having heard from these people that they feel that this life is a dream how do you know that you're not dreaming now how do you know that you're not dreaming now well it depends on the definition what you call a dream and my definition of a dream is that you have conscious experience when you sleep. Uh, when we are here now awake in our waking consciousness, in our daily consciousness, you have in a reality you experience, which is a subjective reality, which is based on the state of consciousness you have. So when you're in love, the world is beautiful. When you're uh, depressed, the world is like hell. So you have a subjective experience. When you are in the other, higher dimension in this enhanced consciousness that everything is more real and direct and it is all about love. Mm -hmm. I talked to my 97 year old aunt last night and uh, she is fearing death and she's um, suffering from what the Buddhists would call monkey mind. She can't think quite properly right now. But what she told me was this. Her husband, who died 20 years ago, um, has not been in contact with her and she desperately needs some reassurance from something. And so she, for the first time, she pleaded with her husband, wherever you are, I need help. Please give me a sign. And that night, for the first time, she had a dream about her husband. She dreamed that they were both uh, in bed, or at least she was in bed, and out of the corner of her eye she could see someone moving from the other side of the bed uh, and out the door. And he was uh, dressed in the clothes that he liked to wear. He was a good dresser. And uh, I asked her, well, how old did he look? And she said, oh, maybe 30, uh, 35. And I asked, well, she, he, had no longer, he no longer had Parkinson's? Yes, he seemed in uh, uh, full youthful vigor. Um, and she was somewhat disturbed by it, but also somewhat reassured by it. Would you say that this was a uh, contact with uh, 
Maybe non-local reality? So this is what, what you are told you is a classical example of an after-death communication, that you are in contact with the consciousness of a deceased relative, in this case her deceased husband. And she prayed for it and he came and she, she saw him and she saw him healthy, so he was healthy again. And for most people this kind of experience has happened during the night because during the night uh, the threshold of consciousness is lower so you are easily accessible for the consciousness of deceased relatives. And it mostly it's, it's a comfort for them because they know now that he is still there somewhere in another realm what we can call the non-local realm because it is beyond time and beyond space. It's always there. You've talked about the enhanced consciousness that exists in a near-death experience. You've also talked about how there is no time and no space in non-local reality and that everything is there at the same time. I can understand the concept of no time but I can't understand the concept of no space. What is it like to, to be in a, an environment where there's no space? Yeah. Well, I will ask the both questions. It's beyond time and beyond space. It is both, which is called the definition as non-locality as we know it from quantum physics. And so this concept helps us to understand. It is an analogy of what people tell us in an death experience. When they have, when they're out of the body, when they are in the higher realm, that they can have a life for you and they can relive every aspect of their life they have. They know again all the thoughts they had. They know what they have done. They also feel the consciousness of others. So they connect with the people in the past and the effect what they did to others as well. When you took something, a plaything from your little sister, you know how sad she was. You feel how sad she was. And the moment, so that's the past, so there is no time. And when you think of some place in the past, you will be there instantaneously. So at the same moment, you are everywhere where you put your attention on, beyond time and beyond space. And when they had a cardiac arrest of several minutes, they can talk for a week what happened. Because they say everything was there at the same time, I was everywhere at the same time. And this is beyond time and beyond space. Also, you can. Uh, experience future events which later become true as well when you're back in your body. So future and the past is there at the same moment. Some mystics when they have their breakthrough experience they report um, a sense of now that they haven't experienced before, a sense of the present in which the past and the future are already um, experienced and in this state they call it eternity. So it must be possible to experience this eternity, this uh, uh, timeless moment in this life. Well, when you talk about eternity, which means there is no beginning, no end to it. Mm -hmm. and, and so, in my opinion, our conscious has no beginning and has no end at all. It has to have been before birth and it will be after our physical death. And that's what we call, again, more local consciousness or endless consciousness. And we can also call it divine consciousness or cosmic consciousness. Consciousness has always been there, and in my opinion, consciousness is even fundamental in the universe. It started with consciousness, and everything comes from consciousness as well. Mystery. But I think what is a great mystery is what is the origin of consciousness. That's it. And a great mystery is what is the origin of life. And I think without, it will never be possible to understand these things exactly, because it is beyond our scope as a human to understand it. We, we can look for it, we can think about it, we can search for it and what we found also in the near-death studies that we found real that there is no beginning nor will there be an end to consciousness and this is also quite new because according to our currently widely accepted mainstream science which is based on a materialist paradigm, consciousness is just a product of the brain, of a functional brain, which means when the brain stops functioning, like in cardiac arrest, that it should be impossible to experience consciousness, that alone the paradoxical occurrence of enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception, emotion, cognition, self-identity, etc. So, what we can find as a result of our 
scientific research of the death experiences is that it's impossible to believe that consciousness is a product of brain function. So for me, the brain has a facilitating function and not a producing function for experiencing consciousness. So the brain is like a transceiver or interface like compared with the computer. So when you have a computer, you have the possibility to receive one billion websites and you can also change websites. So it's transmitter receiver. And the one billion website, the, the, the cloud, is not produced by your laptop. And when your laptop doesn't function, there's still the cloud is there. So I compare this with the non-local consciousness. It's always there, everywhere, inside and outside your body. But you need a functioning brain to experience parts of this enhanced consciousness as our waking consciousness, mm -hmm. which is just a small part, a complementary aspect of this non-local consciousness. Mm -hmm. Dr. Van Lommel, I'd like to read a rather lengthy question that uh, uh, someone emailed me. Uh, her question, this woman is a PhD linguist, which kind of explains the, the wordiness of the question, but here it is. Let us accept for the sake of argument that the brain acts like a radio, that it does not produce consciousness but apprehends or filters it. If this is true, then I think it must be true all the time. It can't be the case that the brain sometimes apprehends consciousness and sometimes creates consciousness. A hallucination is by definition not really there. Therefore, a hallucination is by definition created by the brain and not apprehended by it. Therefore, if the brain is like a radio, there's no such thing as a hallucination. Everything the brain apprehends is really out there floating in the sea of consciousness. All so-called hallucinations or apprehensions of something that's really there. Would you accept this? I, I don't agree with the question what she stated. I think uh, the brain does not produce consciousness. Uh, but when the brain function is distorted, you can have hallucinations. Let's say when you are in coma, you don't have waking consciousness at all. And when you have problems in your brain, your waking consciousness will be distorted, like hallucinations. So you need a functional brain to have hallucinations. When you have a near-death experience, when the brain doesn't function at all, it can, by definition, not be a hallucination. And also, a hallucination is a perception that is not occurring in objective reality. And what people have, when they have a near-death experience, when they have an out-of-body experience, out-of-body perception, you can verify the reported perceptions and you can objectify that really the details they tell you about the uh, resuscitation, about the operation, was really happening. So that is by definition not a hallucination. So the brain for me is a, what I tell an interface, it's a filter and uh, you should receive parts of this non-local or enhanced consciousness as or in tune into your waking consciousness, which is a complementary aspect of your consciousness. And when you had an NDE, this threshold of consciousness has permanently changed. That means that you don't just receive channel one, like in a radio, your own consciousness, but you receive at the same time channel two, three, four, five consciousness of others. So you receive more information, receive more information from consciousness of others as well. So it's a transceiver or interface from information which is outside and it's not a product of your brain. Mm -hmm. But being so sensitive that, that you would uh, be aware of uh, what's going on in other people's consciousness must be extremely disruptive to the people, person who's experiencing it. It's, it's extremely difficult to, see, to, to, uh, to find out that you know what other people feel, or that you know about future events, or that you know that someone will die, that you know about an incoming phone call, that you will know what will happen in an hour or in a day. It's very disturbing. So they, they try to be, not to be in, in, sh in shops or in, 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 in the train or bus, because you received information from everyone. It's very, very disturbing. And when they try to explain what they're experiencing to other people? Well, when they try to explain, you mean about the content of the NDE? No, no, about being bombarded by uh, their awareness of what's going on in other people. That must, it, I would find, 
think that other people would find them to be a bit nuts. Well, that's the problem. And, 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 and they say, I won't talk about it, otherwise I will be put in, in, into an institution. And I know some patients who keep on talking about these kind of experiences, and they were really put into an institution. And psychiatrists thought they were nuts. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. So they are silent about it as well. This enhanced intuition mm -hmm. we have by nature until the age of about six. Children are very open mm -hmm. and feel a lot. But usually they lose this capacity because what they feel and tell the parents, say, oh, this is not, this is not, so you lose the capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have an and the, as a child, you will always be have this enhanced intuition. And when you have a, uh, had an and as an adult, you will have this uh, enhanced intuition as well. Most people have a kind, a little bit of intuition but not as strong as you have it after an NDE. And what's the so normally you have a kind of shield around your head so you don't receive the information from others. When you are asleep, the shield is less thick so you receive more information like dreams, etc. Mm -hmm. Or like after, like after that communication. Mm -hmm. But when you had an NDE, you were open. Mm -hmm. What is the role of, of ego in the near-death experience when you when you're no longer connected with the body, does the ego go also? Well, what we call an ego is what you experience as your self when you are in the body. So it's connected with your body. But we know from the death experiences, when you die, you leave the body behind you. So death is just the end of all physical aspects, but your consciousness goes on. And when you are out of your body, you have this death experience, it's no longer the subject object experience, the dual duality experience we have in this physical world. But you're connected with everything and everyone. So it's it's just it's just subject. And then you still have a kind of identity connected with the whole, like the drip in the ocean and the ocean as well. But it's still a kind of identity which will be kept and that's why it is possible to have this after death communication. But I personally it's not the same as the ego we experience, because the aspect, aspects of what we had, like thoughts or feelings, will be there, but not the real personality. Dr. Van Lommel, what do you anticipate the impact of your research will have on our society as a whole and medical care? I think that's an important question. But what we know now from re scientific research from the death experience is we have to change our ideas about what is what is science, because a widely accepted materialistic paradigm in science means that we have in the current science we have we want to objectify, to measure, to reproduce and to falsify the facts we find. But consciousness is beyond this scope. But consciousness you cannot measure, you cannot objectify, you cannot, you cannot verify, you cannot reproduce, you cannot falsify the content of consciousness. To, according to a strict materialistic paradigm, consciousness does not exist, we, we cannot prove it. So we have to change the idea, what is science? And science is, for me, ask a question with an open mind. And so the consequences also are that when the, cons the consciousness is not a product of the brain, then there will be a continuity of consciousness, and death as such does not exist. There's a continuity, so that is just a changing state of consciousness. And, and that is just the end of our physical body, not the end of our consciousness. So someone told me, I can live without my body, but my body cannot live without me. So when you talk about health care, it's, it's about how do we treat terminal patients? How do we treat patients in coma? Well, there's still a possibility they have the consciousness, but they cannot communicate with this because the brain function has been damaged, but consciousness is still there. We have Alzheimer's. Consciousness is still there, but you cannot communicate with other people. With it. So how do you uh, see about asthenesia or about uh, organ transplant, where you take out a heart out of a warm body with a beating heart, with better diagnosis of brain death, but when you do a heart transplant of, of other organ transplant, you need a, a living organ to transplant. So people where you take off the or half of the organs are not dead, they are brain dead, but they are in the process of dying. But all these kind of aspects is important. So the care of end of life care in hospices will change and you can help people who are dying 
to explain that there is no real death. Yeah, right, right. Uh, there's a continuity, and also for the for the, the family members, it's important. It's for the health care worker, and uh, important. But people have an end of life experience, so a clear consciousness in the dying process, or when they have an death period. Just listen to them. Don't give any comment. Don't call it a hallucination of side effect of drugs of the end stage of a disease. It's a real, a real experience which happens so often, far more often than we know because they are hard to report it, because people are reluctant. So there's a change in our days of life and death. There's a change in science and there should be a change in health care as well. Dr. Van Lam, thank you so much. You're welcome. After our interview was over, I told Dr. Van Lommel about my concerns and even fears about the political crisis that seems to be enveloping this country and about its possible effects on the world. I think you have to listen to your own intuition. Don't agree to fear. Live in the now. Enjoy what, what there is now and we are so privilege to live in this world now. Enjoy nature and don't let fear decide how to live.